say it feels so good to be back ladies and gentlemen welcome to another edition of chris blacks and jpw report i am of course the natural chris black of the saturday night slamcasters podcast independent professional wrestler and everybody's favorite narcissist and on today's show i'm going to talk about everything that went down at this weekend's power struggle event I have six exciting matches to go through with you guys, and without further ado, let's get right to it. In the opening match, you have Toru Yano taking on Zack Sabre Jr. in a no corner pads match. At the start, we have the Young Lions removing all the corner pads, and looking back at Zack Sabre Jr. and Yano's G1 match, I am looking forward to this one because... I really appreciate the wrestling skills that Toro Yano brings as he is a good match for Zack Sabre Jr. So of course we start out with a little bit of wrestling, but Yano unfortunately was the first one to hit the corner. The match goes to the outside and we get a little bit of turnbuckle pass shenanigans. Zack Sabre Jr. comes out but is thrown into the barricades as Toro Yano runs back in and tries to put the turnbuckle pads back on. But of course, Zack Sabre Jr. stops him. Zack wants to wrestle, but Yano was still going for the pads. Zack is very confident in this match. According to the commentators, he is 2-0 against Yano in singles competition. So again, Zack, being as arrogant as he is, thinks that he has this match in the bag. There's more fighting on the outside, and Yano sprays Zack in the face with some of the sanitizer. Zack starts taking Yano apart because he's done playing around and he goes right after Yano's legs. He takes Toro Yano to the outside, puts him in a knee bar between the barricade. But while he's doing that, Yano is selling, but secretly he's tying Zack Sabre Jr.'s shoelaces together. And when Zack releases him from the hold, he discovers that he is stuck between the barricade. He is struggling to get out, but it's too late. Toro Yano makes it back into the ring. Zack Sabre Jr. does not. Zack loses by a countout. Not exactly what I expected, but it's, it's Yano. And unfortunately, Zack Sabre Jr. got Yano during this match. The next match, you can't see me right now, but I am rubbing my hands together because I know that I'm going to get a nice hard-hitting match that only New Japan can deliver in Minoru Suzuki versus Shingo Tagaki for the Never Open Weight Championship. And these two guys waste no time firing off shots at each other. I noticed that Shingo's back is taped up. Apparently the road to power struggle was a rough one for him. They take turns beating the absolute hell out of each other in the corners. The match spills to the outside. Shingo was thrown into the barricade causing more harm to the back. Suzuki, like a shark smelling blood, goes right after the back. Back in the ring, they start throwing forearms back and forth, trying to see who will go down first. I absolutely love this exchange. They worked up to more power moves, but did not go down until both men just collapsed. Suzuki puts Shingo in a full crab, switching it to a half crab to punish him even more, but Shingo is able to get to the ropes. This pace has been pedal to the metal for most of this match. Suzuki goes for a gotch style pile driver, but Shingo fights out, tries to lift him up, but his back gives out for the second time during this match. The first was an attempted made in Japan where his back just could not hold Suzuki up. Suzuki is such a great performer. After being hit with three extremely hard lariats, he struggles to stay on his feet being very animated you have to see it to believe it Shingo just rocks him with several more lariats struggles to lift him but finally gets him up and delivers a last of the dragon for the victory once again new champ Shingo Tagaki never open weight championship awesome match these guys beat the hell out of each other and I mean what do you expect it's Suzuki versus Shingo of course they're gonna beat the shit out of each other absolute incredible match between these two guys in the third match we have kazuchika okada taking on the great okan okay i'm i'm gonna be honest with you guys I, i'm not i'm not sold on this great okan guy he comes out walking like a drunk frankenstein 
Osprey comes out with them, and he's suited and booted. <laughs> so someone on the internet made a comment about Okada's ring gear, calling it the ramen noodle cup jacket. And now I just, I can't get that out of my head. Whenever I see him, I'm just like, hey, there's the ramen noodle cup. But anyway, Okan attacks Okada before the bell like a jabroni. Uh, and then he starts doing all those Mongolian chops, but he starts screaming like a bitch, which I don't know, doesn't make him look like a tough guy to me. And he jumps when he delivers the Mongolian chops. So that, that doesn't accomplish anything but make him look more and more just ginger anyway while i'm shitting on okan i might as well also say that he's not as big as they make him out to be i mean okada's way taller than this guy and it's not like the great okan is even jacked so again i don't where's the threat i start losing interest if you can't tell by now i'm starting to lose interest in this match because i'm just not sold on okan Okada should be making short work of this guy, but I realize he's got to get through him before he gets to Osprey. So, I mean, it is what it is. Okada does his usual offensive moves, doing a good job making this guy look threatening, even though he isn't. But after a spinning rainmaker, he locks on the money clip and Okan looking like he's out. So the ref just stops the match and that's it. Just like that, Okada beats the great Okan. Fuck you, dude. <laughs> Okada invites Osprey into the ring. Osprey gets in, not concerned whatsoever. Cuts a promo saying that he used Okada to become popular, and he starts flaunting his expensive watch, suit, and champagne, saying that when he beats Okada, he will have even more expensive trinkets and challenges him to a match at Wrestle Kingdom 15, which of course, Okada obliges. So there we have it, folks. We have one of the matches set for Wrestle Kingdom 15, Okada versus Osprey. Match is gonna be awesome. I cannot wait. In the next match, we have Kenta taking on Hiroshi Tanahashi. Tanahashi is challenging Kenta for the right to challenge for the IWGP US Championship. And uh, that briefcase have seen better days. It looks like it's been beat to shit, or to be more specific, it's been beat on Tanahashi's head. Both men are slow to lock up, each being very careful not to make a mistake. Kenta, however, just can't help himself and messes up Tanahashi's hair, which is always whipped and dipped every single match. They have a very <laughs> they have a very entertaining air guitar spot where Tanahashi takes down Kenta, gives that signature air guitar spot. Kenta gets up, drop kicks Tanahashi in the back, gives a little bit of the air bass right back at Tanahashi. Who gets right back up and then drop kicks Kenta. Kenta rolls out and grabs the briefcase and is just biding his time. At first, I didn't think Tanahashi was gonna fall for it. He knows what's gonna happen. Kenta is just hanging out by the by the apron with briefcase in hand. So we all know what's gonna happen. Tanahashi goes after Kenta. Referee's not looking. Kenta nails him with the briefcase. Then he starts to take control of the match, working over the head of Tanahashi. However, Tanahashi's not down and out as he goes after Kenta's leg, giving him a dragon leg screw, slowing him down. The pace of the match is pretty slow, but it does pick up when it's needed, so I have no complaints there. The ref gets knocked out when Tanahashi kicks out of a pin attempt. Kenta, uh, he kind of, it's an exaggerated move. He throws himself onto the ref, knocking him out, grabs the case, but Tanahashi stops it. The ref comes to his senses, looks and sees what's going on. And as he's struggling with Tanahashi, Kenta gets nailed with the briefcase. And Tanahashi looks at the ref like, hey, yo fault, dude. <laughs> the pace begins to pick up as Kenta does his signature combo of a shotgun drop kick, delayed drop kick, then climbs the top rope to deliver a top rope double stomp, but only gets a two count. Tanahashi begins blocking every go to sleep attempt, first reversing it into a twist and shout, the second time reversing it into a sling blade. He puts on the clover leaf, but Kenta in a very unique way reverses it into a game over submission 
you get a couple more reverses. Again, these guys are in-ring geniuses when it comes to counters. Tanahashi reverses the game over to the Cloverleaf. Kenta reverses the Cloverleaf back into the game over. As Tanahashi is really close to the ropes, Kenta rolls Tanahashi still in the hold and puts himself between Tanahashi and the ropes, giving Tanahashi no choice but to submit. Kenta retains the right to challenge briefcase for the IWGP US Championship. I am not disappointed in this match whatsoever. These guys absolutely killed it. Their pace was a little slower, but like I said, they knew when to pick it up when the time was right. It was a very smart fought match between these two. Excellent match. Moving on to the next match, we have Kota Ibushi taking on Jay White. Jay White is challenging Kota Ibushi for the right to challenge for the double briefcase. IWGP Heavyweight and Intercontinental Championship on the line for Wrestle Kingdom. Oh, I'm loving that King Switch jacket that Gato is rocking. And at the start of the match, well, Jay does what well, Jay does. <laughs> he tries to distract Ibushi with the briefcase, but Ibushi is still able to gain the upper hand. However, Gato with the distraction helps White gain control of the match, nailing a drop kick to the knee and then slamming him onto the apron. Jay is an absolute great heel. If I haven't explained it before, the reason Jay White is such a good heel is because number one, he's a beatable heel. Number two, his character is very unlikable. And three, his style is that of a sniveling weasel, taking every cheap shot possible and dirty trick to win all of his matches, all while still being a very formidable opponent. And this match emphasizes each of these points. They fight on the outside. Gato, of course, gets involved again. White seizes the opportunity to gain the upper hand and to show that these guys, even though they're professionals, even professionals can make a mistake. We got a bit of a botch. Abushi attempted a moonsault, and I assume Jay White was supposed to get out the way, but he didn't quite get out the way, and Abushi kind of nails him with a awkward elbow. But like the true professionals they are, they both sold the move and they ended up covering it up and just went on to the next spot, which a lot of amateurs, what they would do is they would try to repeat the same spot, which is a pet peeve of mine. So again, these guys are professionals. They covered it up. Unless you have an eye for wrestling like I do, you probably wouldn't have even caught that. This is a great back and forth match between these guys. And at this point, I've noticed something. So with Jay White wearing the red gear and Kota Ibushi rocking the blue gear, uh, seems like they're kind of mimicking the other red versus blue struggle that was going on in the States, if you know what I'm saying. Jay White getting frustrated starts becoming a little bit more brutal with his attacks. He avoids a Kamagoye with a shoulder to the gut and on the second attempt, White reverses the Kamagoye into a backslide, and when he places his feet on the ropes, he gets the three count, and oh my God, Jay White done won the briefcase. Kota Ibushi looks disappointed. Matter of fact, the look on his face is like he just walked in on Jay White fucking his mom. Lord have mercy. I, I can't believe this happened, although I'm not surprised. According to the commentators, they said that there has been 16 successful defenses of the right to challenge briefcase and Jay White is the first to beat the G1 Climax winner for that right to challenge. So we got a little bit of history being made tonight. I don't know what to say. I'm not upset that Jay White gets to challenge Evil or Naito whoever wins the next match. So I can't complain. I mean, sucks for Ibushi, but they may have something planned for him for Wrestle Kingdom, who knows? But I mean, hey, the guy won two G1 climaxes in a row. I mean, that counts for something. It's just a shame he couldn't hold on to that briefcase, but it's still very early. It's only November. We have to get through all of December and who knows what might happen during Wrestle Kingdom itself. And in the main event, we have Tetsuya Naito taking on Evil for both IWGP Heavyweight and Intercontinental Championships. Both men take their time locking up. 
and I can tell right away this is gonna be a very long match because they are pacing themselves perfectly. They're working the head over, exchanging headlocks, working back to the head. On the outside, Evil throws Naito into the barricade so hard he takes out the timekeeper. The match changes gears once Naito gets thrown into the exposed turnbuckle, which Dick Togo removed during the melee outside. Evil once again throws Naito hard into the barricade, taking out the timekeeper for a second time. Like, Evil is not fucking around during this match. He focuses attention on Naito's back, but it's only a matter of time before Naito is able to mount a comeback but is easily distracted by Dick Togo once again. Evil connects with that devastating chair around the neck spot, which, to, oh my God, for the life of me, I don't understand how he doesn't kill his opponents. He wraps the chair around his head and then takes another chair and hits the chair. It's, oh my God, it looks, it looks just devastating. There's no other word I can use to describe that. Evil is working much smarter in this match He's able to counter much of Naito's offense because, well, they're very familiar with each other. Hell, they're, they're former LIJ brothers. Naito's back is taking one hell of a beating, getting thrown into the exposed turnbuckles and the barricades multiple times. We get a lengthy scorpion death lock on Naito, further working over the back, but Naito escapes and is able to deliver one Destino, but not being satisfied with that, he delivers a second one, and as the ref is counting, one, two, Dick Togo pulls the ref out of the ring, taking the ref out. I don't know why that takes the ref out for so long, but he gets pulled out, jumps in the ring, and starts choking Naito with the Garrett. Next, we got old Yujiro, old jobber ass, come running out and attacks Naito, nailing the pimp juice. But that brings out Sonata for the save, who takes out both intruders. But that's not the end of the shenanigans, folks. When Evil catches Naito's foot, he throws it into the ref, taking Red Shoes down for a second time. And out comes Jay White, who looks at both men down, grabs Evil, surprisingly, and looks like he's about to deliver a Blade Runner to him, but instead walks him to the corner, says some things in his ear, then turns his attention on Naito. After delivering a devastating German suplex, out comes Kota Ibushi, who gets rid of Jay White. So now it's just down to Naito and Evil once again, as both men are trying to put the other away. But Naito lands one more Destino and gets the one, two, three. Tetsuya Naito successfully retains both IWGP Heavyweight and Intercontinental Championships. Jay White is not done. He comes out again at the end of the match to gloat about his upcoming title shot, saying that on night one of Wrestle Kingdom, he is doing absolutely nothing and invites Naito to challenge whoever he wants. Hell, he can challenge one of the young boys. But he says that he will be coming for both titles on night two, which brings out Kota Ibushi, who looks like he's just ready to kill Jay who in the end just runs him off. Tetsuya Naito closes out the night, celebrating in the ring as gold confetti, ra confetti rains down on him. And that's gonna do it, folks. Awesome, awesome show from head to toe. Well, minus the great Okan shit. But like I said, nothing's perfect. New Japan still delivers. This show was absolutely amazing and does his job by setting up the matches for Wrestle Kingdom, well, some of them. And every single match tonight, there was stakes involved. So I don't understand why this is so hard to accomplish with all the other wrestling promotions. Matches need to make sense. And NJPW is way ahead of the curve when it comes to making matches feel important. So that's gonna be it for today, folks. If you want to follow me on social media, there are links in the description that'll take you to my Facebook and Instagram pages, as well as my Twitter account. While you're at it, don't forget about the Saturday Night Slamcasters podcast. Links are also in the description that'll take you to our Buzzsprout host site for the podcast, our YouTube channel, 
our Facebook page, as well as our Facebook group. Before you leave, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button, ring that notification bell, so you are alerted every time new episodes are uploaded. We have lots to come. There are three big tournaments coming up, and guess who's covering them all? That's right, your boy, The Natural Chris Black. Thank you for tuning in. I will be back with more New Japan Pro Wrestling coverage. Come get slammed.